Remember Escape the Room Flash games? Entries in this now mostly abandoned subgenre of adventure games were small, mysterious, and most important to me as a kid, free. I must have played like a billion of these in the 2000s, so I thought, now that I'm an adult human being with a job and a vanishing amount of time left until I die, it would be fun to make one. It's been a long time since I've actually played through any of these though, so I decided to revisit a bunch of games from that time so I'd know what to focus on when I make my own. But didn't Flash die? Yeah, it did, but weirdly that doesn't really matter. A lot of websites have workarounds so that Flash games are still playable. Newgrounds was one of those sites I was already aware of. So to start this off, I picked the most played escape room they had, which was Escape the Room by Von Plogelberg. Which maybe wasn't the best idea, since this art style isn't typical of what this genre looked like as a whole. In fact, not many Flash games used 3D, though the ones that did ended up becoming quite famous. The puzzles here are quite standard though, Enjoyable, but only two or three of them actually require any sort of logical leap. Which is kind of a shame, because when I encountered the first puzzle that would take even a little bit of work, uh, I folded immediately and looked up a guide. Now, in my defence, that puzzle is kind of poorly signposted. You're meant to figure out that this bin has a false bottom, and that you can cut that open to get more items. There aren't really any visual cues for this, so I probably would have just wasted 20 minutes staring at a 20 year old game. Looking into the comments, I saw a lot of then 15 year old millennials say that this was a rip off of some game called The Crimson Room, so I decided to play that next. Now I'd forgotten this game's name, but I clearly remember playing this as a kid. I don't know what it is about this game's aesthetic, but there's just something about it which makes it feel like an original, where the last game is clearly the derivative work. Not that being derivative is necessarily a bad thing. I'm just saying I get why it's this game which gets credited for popularising this whole genre. Good job Toshimitsu Takaji. I think the puzzles in this game are a little bit more inspiring. All the objects you're interacting with are interesting, and I really like that there's a gradual build up to revealing this box is actually a projector. Not all the puzzles are winners though, uh, having to open and close these blinds a bunch of times in order to reveal an item, that's a big misstep. At the time I thought maybe this was a convention of the genre that people in 2004 would already know about, but I doubt that since this is one of the first games in their style, and I don't think this was a thing in normal adventure games. Also having to click really odd places to get a better angle of the room is kind of a pain. I know that that is a puzzle in itself, but I feel like it's kind of outside the bounds of what a puzzle should be. Does calling it too meta make sense? Maybe the lesson is just to not rely on that type of puzzle. Toshimitsu also had a bunch of other games in this style, so after I finished this I played the Viridian Room, so I could see how he evolved his style. Visually, not much has changed, it still looks great, but they got rid of the 3D screen transitions, which could have been to remove that awkwardness when switching camera angles, or maybe the dev thought it wasn't worth the bother. Either way, I think it's a shame. The puzzles are also more involved here, but in a way that I'm not sure I fully vibe with. Like, there's good variety, but they all sort of rely on that meta logic in a way that feels a little bit contrived to me. It didn't help that in the last puzzle, I got stuck in a particularly bad experimentation loop, where I was just placing a bunch of items in different combinations until I got the solution. I was uh, too proud to use a guide this time. Getting stuck for too long feels bad, but getting stuck with what is essentially a combination lock is worse. I think that's because I wasn't getting much feedback on whether or not I was getting to the solution or not, while I also didn't have any other leads to follow. The third game in this series strips things back a bit, which I think is a good move. There's also a more focused concept. All the puzzles are about trying to convince someone on the other end of a suction tube to unlock the door for you. How you do that is still pretty abstract, not sure why typing help me on a phone keypad would convince anyone to actually do that. But because there are less things to interact with, you're more likely to notice this puzzle sooner, keeping the pace up. Before I move on to games from other designers, I want to say that the thing that sticks with me with Totsumichu's work overall is how weirdly creepy these games are. There's just something about the stock sound effects and ghostly themes that really sell each game as being a weird web artifact, and that feeling only gets stronger as they age and become more anachronistic. As a kid that was interested in horror, but too scared to actually watch horror media, I think this type of uneasy feeling is what drew me to the genre. I played a lot of other Escape the Room games after finishing this series up, 
But the one series that I felt worth exploring a little bit more was Afro Ninja's Escape series. This series definitely looks more in line with what I remember these games looking like as a kid, which, I mean, I like it. The puzzles here also tend to be a lot more grounded. Every object you interact with works in about the way you would expect. Like, how would you actually use this object in this situation? I think all the games in this series are pretty great, but I particularly like Escape the Phone Booth because of how everything ties back into using the phone. It's like he started designing this by thinking about what a phone can actually do, then built the puzzles around the most interesting possibilities. Where in other games it's more about, oh, how can I hide a code within any given object? Or it's about finding similarities between objects, which is how you get stuff like, put this ring in this ring-shaped slot. Why? Because that's where it obviously goes. Anyway, I think this might be my favourite series I've played so far. Each game has its own type concept, they rarely had me reaching for a guide, and while not the most polished visually, I think that actually helps sell a quiet, sinister tone. Okay, I think that's enough of a nostalgia tour. Shout out to these other games I played, you all captured a certain artistic spirit, uh, unique to the time. But it's time to move on. So, what is my criteria for making a game in this genre, in the style from this time period? Well, the game needs to be about escaping a room. Duh, there can't be any direct NPC interactions. The game needs to be short and the story minimal. And there needs to be a mixture of light horror and comedy elements. Adding on to this, here are some points that I want to hit with my game. The puzzles can't be too difficult, easier than the standard adventure game, while still keeping novelty. Navigating between the different views need to be consistent. Puzzles that follow some sort of moon logic need a clear explanation somewhere. Try whenever possible to bring attention to where the puzzle actually is. Also, the solutions themselves should be funny. After playing all these games, I decided that visually, I wanted the game to look a little bit more like The Crimson Room, but in terms of puzzle design, I wanted to take Afro Ninja's approach. So I started developing this game by just brainstorming for a theme, and for some reason I kept thinking about liminal spaces. Specifically how, as a kid, you're in these liminal spaces, but they've been decorated in a way to make them feel more welcoming to you, with, uh, mixed results. A dark school corridor decorated with notice boards, some of which used colour paper to depict a farmyard scene. A windowless children's hospital waiting room with landscapes painted directly onto industrial brick. I'm not saying that this effort didn't help make the environment feel more comfortable, but there's still something off about the outdoors being represented in such a childish way, especially when you're in a location lacking natural light. Not even to mention that as a child, you're often in these places against your will. From thinking about that, I decided that the name of the game would be Escape the Outside, where the concept is that each wall in the room is a overly simplistic depiction of a landscape. I had a few other ideas, but I felt this concept would work with my art style, since I already lean into a naive style of drawing. By the way, if you don't want the game to be spoiled, uh, now's a good time to follow the link in the description to actually play it. Just make sure to give me a like and subscribe before you do, so you don't forget. Also, if you could come back after, I would uh, really appreciate it. Anyway, after committing to this concept, I decided what the images on each wall should be, then came up with items and interactions relevant to each wall. I don't really know how to describe that process other than it being purely vibes-based. I just turn off my brain and choose the most grabby ideas as they appear to me. Through doing this, a backstory slowly emerged, which is that the aliens that abduct the player think that all humans have the intelligence of, like, a chimp or something. Aha, yes, we shall study the human in their natural habitat, so we'll just put some wallpaper up and they probably won't notice. So that sort of stupidity extends to all the objects in the scene. Oh, what do they sleep on? Hey, duh. Uh, what do humans drink? Uh, milk, probably. Now, I'm pretty sure this specific reasoning doesn't come across, but it was good for inspiration. This backstory did lead to making one puzzle I was a little bit iffy on. It's the one where instead of just clicking on udders, you have to feed grass to a robot cow in order to get it to, um, lactate. Like, I knew I wanted getting milk to be a little bit more challenging, and I really wanted the cow to do something when fed grass, because I felt like that's something the player would likely want to do. So the backstory is that the aliens just don't understand or care how cows actually work. But still, the puzzle felt a little bit too meta for me, and I saw in testing that this puzzle ended up being a pain point. 
so I ended up giving the player, like, explicit instructions on how to get milk. And that didn't seem to bother anyone. There are two maybe lessons here. First one being that a solution being a fun thing players will want to do anyway isn't really a strong enough hint. And secondly, when how an object works in-game differs from our pre-existing mental model, how we expect things to work in real life, I need to find a way to communicate that difference. Sure, that kind of removes a certain deduction element from the game, but I think that part of adventure games are a little bit overrated. Who wants to be stuck for hours? I just want to click on stuff. Okay, maybe that's not true for larger adventure games, where the idea is that you're meant to stop playing and come back later with fresh ideas. But escape room games are meant to be played in one sitting, so things should be easier. Once I had all the puzzles and interactions blocked out, on paper I had to actually start coding this thing, and almost immediately I realised just how poorly suited Unity is to making this genre. Like, I kind of assumed that the reason that there were so many of these back in the day was that they were fairly easy to make, Flash being a very mouse and animation driven game engine. But to achieve the same things in Unity, you have to implement a lot of basic features yourself, which is a problem because I think that the kind of person who wants to make a game like this is not really interested in learning about raycasts or interfaces, scriptable objects, coroutines, or whatever. Anyway, that's sort of why I got sidetracked from making the game itself and spent two months creating a whole toolkit for making escape rooms in Unity with minimal code. It's still in development, but if you want access to it now, and if you want to fund more development of it, you can join my Patreon for $5 a month. Um, sorry about that. Once I finished scripting the puzzles and had them all playable in Engine, I went to about three playtest events to observe what needed to be changed, and basically learnt the same thing each time. That I needed to make it easier. Now this might have had to do with the fact that the events themselves were at a bar where most people already had a drink or two on them, but people kept getting stuck where I didn't want them to get stuck, and when I did want them to get stuck a little bit, it always felt like it went on for way too long. Now making the puzzles easier didn't necessarily mean making the puzzles themselves less interesting or undermining the joke, uh, more so it just meant bringing more attention to the areas of the screen that mattered. Which is sort of funny because I complained about this in the first game I covered. I just think it's one of those things which is more obvious in hindsight, right? Testing wasn't all frustrating though. A lot of times players would combine items that I hadn't thought of, but made sense. Or click on parts of the environment I hadn't even considered to be interactable. I got a lot of jokes out of that. Like, everyone wanted to click on these stalactites, so I added some text. My favourite time that happened was when someone clicked on the text which has inventory, like, underlined, like it was a web link. Once I implemented these jokes, I found that the added feedback made the whole experience feel better, so I added another line to my criteria of good design in this genre. Failing to do something should result in a joke or an explanation why it didn't work, even when it's obvious, but especially if it feels like something that the player is done by earnestly interacting with the game, i.e. not just clicking on everything just because it's stuck. So after three months of work, um, I finally released the game, uh, and you can play it or you can just watch the puzzle playthrough on my channel. Since I've spent so much time working on that kind of backend system, I think I'm going to make more of these escape rooms, so if you're interested, you can sign up for my free tier on my Patreon for updates. Anyway, that's all from me. Uh, subscribe if you haven't, and if you got this far, you should probably give me a like, right? Like, I know you haven't liked a video before, but, you know, why couldn't you start here? Anyway, thanks!